Well, it's great to have everybody hanging out today, whether you're with us in person or online. We are so glad to have you. Before we dive into the book of Acts, if you have your Bibles, you can jump with me to the book of Acts. That's where we're going to hang here in just a moment. But just a couple things want to uh, mention. Uh, first of all, just want to piggyback on what Megan and Malia said about uh, this Wednesday. We're really looking forward to this series called Let's Talk About It. Really, our heart on it is is what are the, the topics that the church needs to be speaking to in, in today's culture? And so that's what we're going to be hitting the next few weeks on Wednesday nights at 6.30 here. And like they said, we're going to bring in some guests from both outside of Stone as well as inside of Stone to address some of these topics in kind of a, they'll be almost separate one-week forums if you will. And this, this Wednesday is those crucial conversations to have with kids. And so if you are a parent, a grandparent, an uncle, an aunt, or maybe you're, you're a couple and you don't have kids right now, but you uh, want to have kids one day, we'll be talking about and just interviewing different parents who have been there, done that on, on, on what do you do when, when your kids begin to have those big questions about God? Or how do you navigate relationships and sex and dating, technology? How do you raise a uh, emotionally and spiritually healthy kids in today's culture. So those are the topics we'll be hitting uh, this, this Wednesday. So I think the next few weeks will be a fun time on, on Wednesday night. So that's the first thing I want to encourage. And then just the next thing before we dive in is next Sunday, we have a, a super big, amazing announcement for our church. So there you go. Don't miss next Sunday. A super big, amazing announcement for our church. And I'm not going to tell you this week, so don't ask me. Next Sunday, we have a super big, amazing, awesome announcement for our church. So I'll see you next Sunday. Let's go to the book of Acts, shall we? <laughs> Acts. So uh, think of, of maybe a program that you enjoy watching. A program you enjoy watching for us. I'm, I'm semi-embarrassed to tell you uh, that in our home, we watch this show called When Calls the Heart. And so in our home, we would be hardies, so they say, hardies. And my only saving grace is I've got a wife, I've got two daughters, our dog is actually a female as well, and so I'm surrounded by gals in our home. And so what happens, my, my father-in-law says, Jeff, you've been sissified. And over the course of when you have daughters, it's just there's a sissification process that takes place that I can do nothing about. And so I've been sissified. So we watch When Calls the Heart, and it never fails when there's a climactic moment or you wonder what's going to happen next. You get that dreaded phrase that we don't like that is to be continued, to be continued. And you're, you're kind of left wondering what, what's going to happen next. We, we, we've all been there before. Well, uh, most of the Gospels, a lot of the Gospels end with the ascension of Jesus. But the cool thing is that we're, we're not left to wonder what happens next because we have the book of Acts. Acts is sometimes called the Acts of the Apostles. And so what we're going to do is take about the next 10 weeks and walk through uh, this this book. Uh, what we like to do when we start new studies together is just give some background on the book for maybe five minutes. And so if you've got a pen or paper, you are in to take a notes and that type of thing. Let me give you just a back bit of background on the book of Acts. First of all, uh, the book of Acts is written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit uh, by Luke, who is the same author as the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we, we, we know that Luke is the author of Acts for a few different reasons. First of of all, the author of Acts appears very educated. And we know that, that Luke was educated because he was a doctor. He had a medical background. And so uh, the book of Acts doesn't specifically say that the author was a physician, but again, they were very educated, which leans us towards, towards Luke. Secondly, is, is we know that Luke and Paul were friends and companions in ministry. And what we're going to see is around Acts 16, we're going to see the language shift from you to we. And again, Luke is, is an intelligent, educated doctor. And so he, he would understand uh, about when you're writing specifically you or we as he will begin to include himself uh, in those travels in Acts chapter 16. And so Luke is the author. When was it written? So, there, there's two dates that are given. A.D. 63 
and then A.D. 70. Those are the two prominent dates given for the writing of Acts. Most lean towards the earlier date because there are events that took place between A.D. 63 and A.D. 70 that are not included in Acts that most believe would have been included in Acts. And so most lean towards that earlier date of A.D. 63. It was written like Luke to Theophilus. His name means, I believe, lover of God. And what, what I found interesting is that there are many people who believe that Theophilus was a wealthy individual who actually employed Luke as a doctor. And that when he responded to the gospel, when, when Theophilus responded to the gospel, that he actually released Luke to be a traveling companion for Paul. And so that's some background that I found intriguing. What's the theme or importance of the book of Acts? Acts really serves as a bridge between the gospels and the rest of the New Testament. In fact, we'll, we'll, we'll jump into chapter one in just a moment here, but if you turn there right now, you'll see it says in verse one, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And so that was really the emphasis of the gospels. And, and now Acts is gonna be really what Jesus continues to do and to teach through the disciples and through the early church. And so it really serves as a bridge. Something else that I think is, is important and I find encouraging. So I find encouraging is what we're going to study the next 10 weeks. The book of Acts is going to cover about 30 years. So basically, we're going to cover the first 30 years of the early church. And over the course of these, these chapters, these 30 years, what we're going to read somewhere around 30 miracles. So on average, on average, at least what is included in the inspired text of scripture, on average, this early church saw one miracle a year. And why do I say that? Because sometimes people can think or maybe say, or maybe you heard of this, well, we, I just wish the global church could get back to Acts. I just wish we could just go back and just be the church of Acts. And I don't know about you, but I feel strongly that there is at least one miracle happening every year. And so I only say that to say this, the church of God is alive and well. The church of God is alive. We are seeing miracles take place. God is doing incredible things. He is moving. He is, he is changing lives and families. We saw some be baptized here today. We are seeing people like the early church love and just serve and honor and prefer one another. The church of God is alive and well. Amen. And so I just shared that to encourage you. We're going to hit up Acts 1 and 2 today, but let's start with the first eight verses of chapter 1. It says, in my former book, Theophilus, I, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions to the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after a suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of how many days? 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times, the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It was very common in, in ancient writing that when, when an author wrote a sequel, to start the sequel really summarizing the first part of their previous work and then give a summary of what they're going to include in their sequel. And we really see Luke doing that right here in the book of Acts. If you see there again in the first few verses, he says, in my former book, here's what I taught all that Jesus began to do and to teach. 
And so he summarizes the Gospel of Luke and then really a a key verse or a summary for the book of Acts is in verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so Jesus... After his resurrection, he spends 40 days giving what the Bible says here are convincing proofs. And I was intrigued by what that word means in the Greek. It literally means demonstrable evidence. Demonstrable evidence. So he appeared for 40 days, giving just demonstrable evidence that he was alive, that he had rose from the dead. So it's demonstrable evidence versus evidence from witnesses or eyewitnesses. And so Jesus rose from the dead. He he could speak. People could uh, touch him, interact with him. He gave these convincing proofs. And then he gives this mission for their life. He says, I want you to to go and I want you to, to be my witnesses. But before that, he says, I want you to wait for the baptism or the coming of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, how many of you would, would say that you are a type a personality in the sense of when you've got something that you have to get done, you want to just get it done, right? You, you love to cross things off your list. Would you raise your hand if you're a type A person? You love to just get things done. You don't like things hanging over your head, right? You just get it done. Okay, how many of you, now this is a safe place. <laughs> safe place. Okay, you're, you're in church, safe. There, there's no shame in this game, all right? Safe place. You, you can be a bit of a procrastinator, or maybe let's, let's put a positive spin on it. How many of you thrive under pressure? You just thrive when your back is against the wall. You just thrive and do your best work, right? You just, I can be a bit of a, a type A personality. I just, I love just, to, I want to just get, if I got to get something done, let me just get it done. So Jesus gives them this mission here to, to reach the world But what does he say to do first? Wait. Don't do it. Pause. Why? Because he wanted to equip them with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, think with me for for a moment. These are not logical illustrations, but just go with me anyways. That that you graduate from pilot school. And the moment you graduate from this pilot school, you are free to fly these jumbo jets and take two, three hundred passengers around the United States. And that you, you, you graduate and you can now fly people around and they simply say, congratulations, you now have your pilot's license. You are free to go buy a jumbo jet for yourself and you can then transport people. It's not realistic. Or maybe you, maybe you graduate or you get some military training and you're now prepared and ready to help defend our country from enemies. And they say, listen, you are trained on how to, to drive a tank so you can go on marketplace or auto trader, buy a tank, and then just go do your thing. It's not realistic. They give you what is necessary to accomplish the task. And this is really the beautiful thing is that, that Jesus gives these, these apostles, these disciples, this, this mission to reach the world, but he gives them what is necessary to complete the task through the equipping, empowering work of the Holy Spirit. Then we come to verse, verse 12. It says, then the apostles, after Jesus has ascended into heaven, returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath stay walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were a whole bunch of people. Verse 14, they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, and with his brothers. In, In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long through, long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called the field in their language a keldama, that is the field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary 
again, with he, as he's with the 120, to choose some, one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us, for one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. You, you don't have this on the screen, but you can see it in your Bible there. Verse 23, so they nominated two men, Joseph called Bersabbas, also known as Justice, so he had three names, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. They, then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So it was added to the 11 apostles. So after Jesus ascends into heaven, they go right there from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem, which the Bible says is a Sabbath day walk. How long was that? A Sabbath day walk was around 3,000 feet. So it's somewhere around a half mile. So th this is not a, a long distance to walk at all. They get there and, and everybody's up in the upper room, which they typically did and gathered in biblical times. And so they are there and they are just gathered together. And I love what the, the, the new King James Version says about this. It says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. They were in one accord. They were just united together. And I just, I just dig that because when you read the gospels, you see the disciples, there was some bickering and struggling, but now you find them just united in, in one accord. And this is the beautiful thing about the body of Christ is, is we all come from different journeys and, and backgrounds, but we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are the family of God. That's just the, the cool thing about when we gather, we just hug one another and encourage one another and pray for one another. Just there's it's, it's the body of Christ. Well, they're there, and Peter, he stands up, and what does he say? He just goes after it, right? He's a listen, and this is what Judas did. He, he betrayed, he bought a field, and then he fell, and his guts spilled out, and his intestines spilled out. It just just. Peter, the fisherman, right? Given all the gory details. I'm sure some people were, were in the crowd going, Peter, T-M-I, bro. Do you know any T-M-I people in your life? They give too much information. Peter, he's just, he's just giving it. But he says, the, 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 the Old Testament says we, we need to replace Judas. And so they detail right there in verse 21 they're like, listen, he, he, here's what's necessary. And lays it out. They need to have been with us the whole time from John's baptism up until now. And they had to be, in verse 22, they're a witness of the resurrection. So that's, that's the key. And so what do they do? It says that they, they cast lots to see who would be, who would replace Judas back about probably, I don't know, it's probably 20 years ago now. Uh, Karen and I, we've been married. It'll be 25 years this fall. So we've been married maybe, I don't know, two, three, four years. And we were going on an anniversary getaway up to Victoria. And part of getting to Victoria, at least the route that we were going to go, you had to take this three-hour ferry boat ride from Anacortes up to Victoria. And we were actually excited about this, this boat ride. We, we packed food, and, and we packed some different games, and we thought we'd make this a, a fun part of our anniversary getaway, just the, the, the long ferry boat up there. So, so we're there. We're hanging out. We're in our booth there, and, and we get out the game Yahtzee. Any Yahtzee lovers in the house? We get out Yahtzee. Yahtzee. So we get it, get out Yahtzee and just her and I are playing Yahtzee. And you know how it is. If you're married on your anniversary getaway, you're kind of looking for some one-on-one -on -one time, right? You can look for some one-on-one -on -one time. So, so where they were playing Yahtzee and some rando stranger gal <laughs> walks up to us while we're playing and asks if she can play with us. People, you don't do that. <laughs> Nobody does that. Now, maybe you're more spiritual than I am. And you thought, oh, man, just what a great God moment. <laughs> just get a chance to make a new friend. I hated it. <laughs> it was so awkward as you're playing Yahtzee with a rando 
stranger because like you're on, oh, good, good role. What's your name again? You know what I'm saying? It, it, was, it was so bad. So what's up with the whole Yahtzee thing to just select the next follower of Jesus, the next disciple, and they say they cast lots. Old Testament priests would use the, these stones called Urim or Thummim. Urim or Thummim. And it was thought, according to Proverbs 16, I believe, Proverbs 16, that that was a way that God would really reveal his will. And so that's probably what they had in mind at this point in time. But the, the, here is what is so significantly important. There is no way on earth I would do anything remotely close to this today. Importantly, we never see this happen again in the rest of the New Testament. Why? Because the day of Pentecost will come. The Holy Spirit will equip and empower people. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth, right? So there is no way on earth we want any part of anything remotely close to us today because we have the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, all right? Acts chapter Two, when, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. We now fast forward about 49 days, somewhere in that ballpark, to Acts chapter 2. And as the, the, the church then gathers, we, we see three different phenomena, if you're taking notes, three different phenomena that they really are a part of right here in these first few verses of Acts chapter 2. Number one is this, they heard. They heard the sound like the blowing of a violent wind. Now, notice that, that it does not say that they felt the wind, but they heard the sound of a violent wind. Now, what, why is that significant? Because the Greek word for, for wind and spirit are the same word, pneuma. Secondly, they saw tongues of fire. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. So they heard, and now they saw what seem to be tongues of fire. Again, significant because in the Bible, fire is used to describe both the presence of God as well as the purifying work of God. So they heard, they saw, and, and lastly, number three is they spoke in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So, so they spoke. So this is a separate and subsequent filling of the Holy Spirit from the salvation experience. So it's separate and subsequent, and we see the transformational effect that this has on these disciples is they went from doubting and wondering and struggling to having a new power and a new presence. The, the, the resurrection of Jesus and the infilling, empowering work of the baptism of the Holy Spirit has now prepared held them in to mission and what God has for them. And so they are there and this powerful work is taking place. And it says in verse five, now they were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. So crowds begin to gather and if you look down at verse 13, some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. So this powerful work is taking place. Crowds begin to gather. And then Peter stands up, look with me, at verse 14. He stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. 
in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. If you have your Bible, you might want to underline those verses right there. Verses 17 and 18, right there. So Peter stands up and gives this message to the residents of Jerusalem, as well as the visiting Jews. And, and pre pretty significant. Let me share just a couple things that, that I think are powerful from this moment right here that you might want to write down in your notes. Number one is this. God loves to use restored people for his purposes. God loves to use restored and transform people for his purposes. I mean, think about Peter. This is the dude who denied that he knew Jesus multiple times. And yet here he is after day of Pentecost giving really the first sermon. God loves to use restored people because this was, in a sense, the fulfillment of a prophecy God had spoken over his life when he said, you will strengthen my brothers. Peter, you will strengthen my brothers. And so I would just encourage us all with that, is that all of us have a journey, a story, a past, and God is in the business of transforming and restoring and redeeming our story for his purposes and then using us for his glory. Amen? Amen. Secondly is this, God loves to use people of all ages, all ages. In fact, just, just, that's, that's why I encourage you to underline those those verses right there. In my last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit. And what, what is said right there? Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. I would encourage every young person here today, J high, high school, college, young professional. God has plans and purposes for your life down the road. Yes, but God also wants to use you today, right now. In fact, when, when you look at Christian history, Many missionaries, many spiritual movements, many awakenings, many church plants are really just driven and fueled by young people. And so God has, yes, beautiful plans for you down the road, but he wants to use you today, right where you are, at your school, at your university, in your neighborhood, in your relationships, where you work, today. Today. God can use you in significant ways just to, to see people reach. And then on the other end of the spectrum, now I'm not going to say what age is old. Should we say older? Whether you're, what, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90, whatever you would classify as old, what do we see here? God wants to use you too. Your story isn't finished. Man, you, you can get a dream for how God wants to use your life. Man, don't think that your best days are in your past. No, God wants to do a new thing in and through you today, today. And so I encourage you with that. It could be, it could be in your family, in your kids, in your grandkids. It could be a new dream. It could be a new ministry, but God has plans for you. And what does it say right here? Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. I, I periodically get asked about women in leadership because obviously we, we believe in, in women in leadership and them just using their full kingdom potential. And so I, I'm periodically asked about that. And there is so much scripture to support that. And this would just be one tiny example right here. Just, I will pour out my spirit on both men and women and they will prophesy, right? So men, women, God can use you in incredible ways for his kingdom purposes. What he's then going to do there for the rest of, of, of majority of this chapter is really get, give this message that is just deep in content as he really just emphasizes that Jesus is the Messiah. And he then in verse 38, you can look at there with me in your Bibles, says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then it says a little bit later on that, that they accepted his message. They were cut to the heart and 3,000 were added to the church's number that day. 3,000. 
ushering in then really the church age that we are a part of today. The church was, was on the move. And then in verses 42 to 47, we really see just, just the seriousness with which they took the mission of God and just their involvement in, in God's work. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. What does it say? They, they, they were devoted. I, I, I love that in the Greek language. That, that Greek word is proskaterio. 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 And, and it means to stay close to or to serve personally. Stay close to or to serve personally. So, man, they were just close. They were fully engaged. They, they served one another. And we see right here just like, like four just different aspects that really just marked this early church that really led to God's favor. Number one is this. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They, they took the word of God very seriously. So important. Because wouldn't you agree with me that it is hard to grow beyond what you know? So the, the word of God is so seriously, it's, it's, this is our first Sunday of the new year, and it's, it's just a, a great time for us all to make a, a fresh commitment to spiritual disciplines in our life. And what, what I would mean by that is just take it maybe just t- literally 10, 12, 15 minutes a day. Just getting a cup of coffee, putting on some worship music on your phone and, and just reflecting upon God's goodness, reading maybe eight to 10 verses, reflecting on them, maybe just sharing with God what's on your heart, allowing him to speak to our heart through his word and maybe get another devotional book and, and, and read that and just take 10, 12 minutes a day just to say, God, I just want to have this. I want to take your word of God seriously because I want you to grow, be anchored in truth in the culture that we live in and, and make a fresh commitment to, to being here on Sundays as a church family. Wait, each and every Sunday, we are going to open up God's word each and every Sunday that we would just grow and be transformed by the power of, of God's word. And I, I mean, I take great comfort in, in the fact that the Holy Spirit is able to just internalize and personalize his, his word like only he can. That this is the power of God that that is we're just talking, just the Holy Spirit would just just speak specifically to each of our hearts. That that's the work of of His Spirit. So we just devote ourselves to God's Word. Secondly, they just were committed to just serving one another in the family of God. There's, there's over 50 one another's in scripture. Encourage one another. Pray for one another. Come alongside one another. And what is significant about those, you guys, is this. An overwhelming majority of those one another's in scripture requires physical presence. Requires us to, to be here, to be gathered together like, like the Bible encourages us to do. We are not called to be lone ranger Christians, amen? We're called, we're called to be together. And so again, gathering, whether it's just groups and surf teams, I just I want to immerse myself and be a part. Because I want to put just faith at the center of my life. Number three is this, that they prioritize just worship together. And then number four, they prioritize outreach. Man, we want to be an arrows out church. We want to love our community well, and there's going to be just many opportunities, big, medium, small in 2024 as we gather together. I want to invite you to stand to your feet with me here. And we just thought just across the different campuses today that, that we would just respond in worship to this message. And, uh, and you are invited to respond in, in whatever way you, you can just sing in your seats and respond there. You can find a place and pray down here. You can sing, whatever. 
But I think this is a great opportunity, you guys, to just take this song in a fresh, new way. Say, God, I just yield my life to you. I yield my life. I yield my family. I just turn everything over to you, to your perfect plan and purposes. God, I just want just a fresh sense of your spirit working in my life. And I just, just make this my prayer and declaration today. And what I think is so cool is, is man, those, those disciples, man, they, they were just filled with confidence and boldness as the spirit of God worked in their life. And that's the cool thing is, is we, we don't know what we're going to face in 2024, but we can walk into it with confidence. Guys, we can walk with confidence in this next year because God is with us and he is for us. And so as we just sing this song together, can we just make this our hearts cry, our prayer, say, God, I need more of you. Spirit, I need more of you. And I'm just yielding my life to you, putting you at the center and making this my prayer as an individual and us collectively together as a church.